Game four is in the books. Knicks go to Atlanta, and unfortunately, we were not able to get the Hawks back Bro, for stealing home court the way that they the did in game one. Tough loss today. Julius Randle started off okay. You can see he was more aggressive. Got to the rim, took some crazy shots, but still ended 7-19 for the field. 23 points, 10 boards, and a rough foul that Danilo Gallinari didn't like. Neither did Scott Foster and the referees. RJ Barrett played a lot better in this game, 21 points, 53% from the field. But nonetheless, the Knicks got smacked up by the Hawks in game four. Must win game. Nothing else to it. Ashley, how you feeling? Not great, CK. I've been better. For a multitude of different reasons. I mean, for starters, you work for home court advantage because not because it's supposed to be easy to win on home court, but because it's almost supposed to be a guarantee, right? Mm. You're playing in front of your home crowd. You're playing on your own court. You're familiar with how um, it works in terms of, you know, the feeling of the court, the vibe, everything like that. The Knicks you know, fumbled that bag. And that would have been a difference maker in this series because what had gone down in Atlanta would not have been a make or break situation for you going into game five. The series would be tied, right? right. So, um, you know, the Knicks allowed, and when I say the Knicks, Julius Randle, RJ Barrett, allowed the intensity of the garden to get the best of them. And in in effect of that, in, in spite of that, um, didn't get the job done you know what i mean they yeah. they didn't do what they had to do on game in game one at home so now you're in the situation and it's always hard i don't really care how many knicks fans travel to atlanta it is always hard winning on the road you know they right. say a series doesn't start until somebody loses at home and the knicks did that in game one so game one. um it's that situation that's frustrating because it didn't have to be this way mm -hmm. um it's also julius randall has just not been showing up um, and you know, in the beginning game one, I believe that game one sets the, the vibe, the tone for the series, right? So I know he was nervous. I know, you know, your first playoff series, it's okay. You get it. But it's a little odd to me to be so affected by the way he was affected when you're at home. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I don't know if you feel the same way, no, but 100%. I feel like the nerves... I totally understand the nerves aspect. You know, I get nervous sometimes whenever I have to go live on TV, especially if it's my first <laughs> time on a certain network that's happened to me. But next game or after, after a few minutes, you're kind of in it and you feel comfortable. So I understand, you know, the first quarter, maybe having some nerves at the garden, but you're playing at home. You know, these fans are there for you. You know, there's no oppositions in right. there. The ops aren't in there looking to take you down. You're playing in front of family. So it should have been a level of comfort that I don't know why he didn't have. I don't understand why nerves got the best of him at the garden. I would understand it more if he got nervous game three, game four here in Atlanta. Um, but the nerves aspect, I just, I'm having a hard time understanding why you're nervous at home um i don't know if you feel the same way about that uh yeah 100 percent. i mean t to be completely honest with you game one i was fully expecting that I, we had we had been doing some pre uh pre series shows and i on my own channel so like that uh, i i, I full heartedly expected him and rj to have a bit of the jitters in that first game because look man but we for jumped... the entirety of a game no 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 i understand I, the first I, quarter look, but the whole game for game one i'm talking about just game one i'm not talking about for the both wow. games i'm talking about just game one i mean it was to be it could have been expected i mean uh look we we're not only are we jumping from what what three thousand fans to 15 in a, a span of yeah. a week you know what I mean? And especially for this team that was playing so well, I'm not saying that they would not have played this well if there were not fans in the stands. But at the same time, it makes a difference because they just this team right here, the majority of this team did not did not get to taste uh, the, the feel, the power, the, 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 the energy of the garden as they did in that first game. And knowing that everybody was there, you're hearing the MVPs at a louder scale for Julius Randle. You're hearing, you know, the RJ Barrett chance, all, so on and so forth. So it was expected to me, in my humble opinion, that there was going to be jitters in that first game coming from RJ and, and Julius Randle. And I even threw quickly in there, but he said, no, I'm good. <laughs> you don't worry about me, CK, because he played good in game one. But that was it. I thought it was going to be a wrap there. Julius Randle said it himself. He was, he, he was, he was rattled 
come into game two and have a better game. And then, yeah, you can just see it's just been a weird series from home court to in Atlanta. And even tonight where I feel like he played a little bit better, it still wasn't to form. Uh, to be completely honest, I feel like, and John Collins kind of uh, hinted at it uh, after, I think, game three. Uh, the, the the simple thing is they just got in his head and they're letting Julius be, be emotional. And unfortunately, that's just been who he's been his entire career. I've got a bunch of Laker fans who's been hitting me up. Like, yeah, damn, it looks like y'all getting that uh, purple and gold Julius now in the playoffs and looking like the same Julius you guys had before because it's true. I mean, John Collins says something. Julius Randle's in his ear saying something else, not worried about his game on the court. And it goes from him to Trey Young, who's they, – they, they're they trying to get in his head, and unfortunately it looks like it was working um, up until this game. Uh, and I, so I'm, I'm right even, there with that's you. Even more, but that's even more of a reason why I'm confused. That's what I was just going to say. As to why he right. got in his own head at right. home. Right. I totally understand when you're on the road and they're chanting, Julius is overrated, and, right. and they have all these different chants that they do when you're at home. Regardless of how many Knicks fans showed up in Atlanta, you're still not home. So you're mm-hmm. still going to be the minority in the situation, mm-hmm. right? But to get that frazzled... And, and not feed off of the energy of people who you know are there for you. There's nobody there who's going to, you know, say you're overrated and get that chant going. That's not going to happen at home. So for mm-hmm. me, I expected more of the nerves in the beginning of game one. But I expected him to be able to play through it and feed off the energy from the crowd and use that to kind of have one of his best games. And if anything, I expected the nerves to happen more in Atlanta when you're in an environment where people are booing against you or or chanting things that are, you know, getting in your head. But for game one and game two to not be two of Julius's best games in this series is troubling to me because that's where you're supposed to play your best basketball when you're home, when you when you're able to play in front of family and friends right. and fans. And it just it didn't go that way. And that's concerning in itself. It's also concerning that there are aspects of his game. And again, I don't agree with people who are saying, you know, Julius is overrated and Julius is this, Julius is that. Yeah. I don't believe in that. I think you can't finesse an entire NBA season. And what Julius Randle has done in this NBA season cannot be ignored and it cannot be discredited. So we're not going to do that. But there are aspects of his game that are not translating into the postseason. And there are aspects of his game that aren't, that he's not, and the things that he can do well are also not translating into (laughs) the postseason. And there's something that, there's a disconnect there. And if you watch it, there's a lot of, I don't know. There's just there's a lot of things that are just not making the translation. And and again, we said this before the series even started. The postseason is different basketball. The game changes and people think I'm crazy when I say that the game completely changes. And there are sometimes the things that you can get away with that you can do like you can do well, you can do with ease in the regular season that you can't do in the post. And I think Julius is learning that the hard way. I don't think he's overrated. I don't think he's all these negative things people are saying about him. I just think that there are aspects of his game that he has not mastered enough. And there are aspects of his game that are also um, weak spots that are translating and each has an, a different effect on what he's able to do in this series, in addition to nerves. Yeah, uh, 100%. We, we, you can easily tell the shot's not hitting the same way. And and to, to your point that, you know, playoffs are a different beast than the regular season – that was something that I had mentioned halfway through the season, you know, being as excited as we were about his numbers uh, jumping up, especially from the three. Uh, what worried me was I feel like he was trying so hard to not be the 2019, 2020 Julius Randle that he wasn't going to the rim as aggressively and as much as he did in the past of his career that I felt like he almost was going to go away from that game ultimately coming into the playoffs and I think we're seeing that right now I, I've watched several possessions in this entire series mm-hmm. where he's been switched on to guys like Trey Young Kevin Herter and any of the smaller guys you want to mention and even oh shoot even uh, Danilo Gallinari who all respect I get it but guys like those where he should be running them over and going to his Julius Randle special and just yeah. being a bully 
And I feel like that's just something that I don't know if he's just having a hard time wiring it all together that I can shoot and still be a, a bully Julius Randle. I don't know if he's having a hard time with that, but uh, it, it, it feels like it, more times than not, he's not mm-hmm. – he, he's settling for the jump shot rather than going to uh, one of his biggest strengths in, throughout his entire career, and that's getting to the damn rim. Because I, I, yeah. I really believe that that's something that would have helped us out up until this game is if him, R.J. Barrett – I mean, we see De- Derrick Rose doing it any way he can, whether it's the floater, push shot, around the rim, Derrick Rose old 2010 pa- uh, layup packages. He's getting to the rim, so I feel like – Guys that are as strong as R.J. Barron, uh, uh, Julius Randle, they should be doing the same thing. Yeah, he's not he's not playing big. Yeah. Um, you That's know, he's not playing his size. And I think – and also he has some habits that work, again, in the, in the regular season that you can't do in a playoff series because you only have a certain amount of games to get it done, right? So when you are someone who is not being able to – deal with being double, you know, double teamed and you don't understand the concept of passing the ball when you don't have an open shot and you have the mentality that you always have to be the one to take the shot and you always have to be the one who has the ball in your hand. You can get away with that kind of mentality in the regular season when if you lose a game, you have 70, well, in this case, 72 more, you know what I mean? 71 more to go ahead and play, right? Right In the playoffs, you don't have that luxury because every game counts and i think he has bad habits that he has to break because when you get into the postseason a lot of the stuff you could do like we said in the regular season you cannot do julius cannot play small you cannot constantly have the ball in your hand when you're not the one with the hot hand you can't constantly feel like you have to take the shot If you don't have the hot hand, you have to kick the ball out. You can't get frustrated by the double team. You can't go ahead and complain for every single call. You're not going to get calls. It's going to be very lopsided sometimes, as we can see. There are a lot of things that he was in bad habits of during the regular season that we spoke about, that we were frustrated about as fans, right, that have followed him into the postseason that are now affecting him, and you're seeing it more in high definition because now it's on a national scale. And also you're seeing how it can affect a series versus having the cushion of an entire very long basketball season. Live and direct. Yes, sir. In Atlanta. Yo, the uh, Super Chats, the chat coming for you, bro. They're saying it's your fault, man. How's They're calling you a jinx. Bro, I gave y'all the most epic win in Madison Square Garden history. <laughs> what are you talking about? I was out there. We shut down 7th Avenue. I've been at every game. I was at the only game that we won. I was at the Spurs game that we won. Listen. You were at three games that we lost, though, so. <laughs> Listen, we calling out me. We calling out Randall. We calling out this. Listen, I said this on the show before that. I'll say this now. In the series, the better team is prevailing. And right now, it's the Hawks, man. They are the more talented team. They are giving us the business. They are beating us in every facet of the game. Offensively, defensively, rebounding, coaching. They have the more dominant team. We just have to face the facts. We have reached our pinnacle, which is not bad. We have made it to where we can make it to. We've overachieved with Rand, with Tibbs. They did a great job this season. I'm not going to throw Julius under the bus like many have because we've said it all year that he is a 1B player and maybe a 2A player. We need more firepower. You know what I'm saying? We've always known that we need more at the point guard position. We know that we need more at the wing. And that's showing itself through this series. And so, you know, there's only so much that we can do to to try to win this series. At the end of the day, the Hawks have been the better team, and they're showing that. The Knicks have been the better team in one half of basketball. And that was the second half of game two, where they came back and one of their defense was on the point. But the, the, the fact remains is that they have a triple threat from the point guard position, something that we've been starving for. D. Rose is D. Rose. He's our guy. But he's not our point guard of the future. We cannot go into next year with him as a starting point guard. We need the starting point guard. You got zero points from Reggie Bullock at the three. RJ did what he can do. But, you know, he missed wide open shots. Bullock missed wide open shots. And what happened when the Hawks had their shots? Gallinari came back with a vengeance. Bogdanovich has been a beast. Collins. Collins himself went on a 7-0 run in the second quarter. They opened it up in the third quarter. You have Herder. They have too much firepower for us to try to stop, man. It's just that, you I, know, I've been to every game. We, I, I, listen, 
I will agree with you in turn, and I think it's hard. I think it's hard to not agree with you in terms of you know the Hawks having more offensive power. That's I mean Stevie Wonder could see that. You know what I mean? That <laughs> it just is what it is. But we this is a team that we are evenly matched with because we have what they don't have, and that's defense. And we're not even playing to our strengths. So that's the frustrating part is we already know we went into the situation with a deficit, right? Because we're not offensively talented like the Atlanta Hawks are. That just is what it is. But it's frustrating to go into a series and watch these games unfold and you're not even playing to what you do have. And that's a strong defense that makes it hard for people to score. That makes them have to go ahead and work a little bit harder, take shots that they may not want to take. You're not even doing that. You, Ash, you can't cover everybody. You got to understand something. This Knicks defense, what Tibbs is trying to do, he's trying to take away the high percentage shot. That's a two-point shot and trying to avoid drawing a foul, right? So you're going to give up three-point opportunities. Yes, your rotations have to be crisp. I understand that. But you're going to give up three-point opportunities. But what the Hawks have is they have the firepower to convert. Whether it's Collins, Gallinari, Herter, Bogdanovich, Trey Young. I just gave you five people. Hunter, that's six people that are better three-point shooters than anyone that the Knicks have on their roster. You can't shut down everybody. I understand our defense has been lax. I understand we're giving up a ton of three-point looks. But when we have our three-point opportunities, our open ones, we're not hitting them. When they have theirs, they're hitting them. And it starts with their point guard, who we have not been able to stop all series. Yes, you're going to start D. Rose, but you're going to give up a ton defensively. You're going to try to trap Trey? Okay. The lob is over your head to Capella. He's got Collins on the wing. He's got Hurt on the wing. You know, I, I hate to sound like it's Hawks fan TV over here, but after having watched four games in a row of these two teams matching up, their offense is very good. This is a team that went 27-11 and 11 under Nate McMillan to finish the season. Hunter, as I've said all season, he's going to be the X factor. He took Julius one-on-one. Then they have Capella shadowing Julius to, to cover him his drives. On top of that, the Knicks have not been a good team finishing at the rim all year, whether it's against the Hawks or any other team. So, it, listen, I, I understand we're, we're trying to find answers, but I just feel like at the end of the day, we've come up on our number. We've faced our number, and the Hawks just have our number. Maybe we can win at the Garden. Maybe Wednesday we can win at the Garden. I sure hope so to make a series out of it, but I just feel like the talent is prevailing. Kenny Payne said on TNT, he told Charles Barkley, this is a series of skill versus will. The Hawks have the more skilled players. The Knicks have Will. Our Will has gotten us here to the fourth seed. Josh, how you doing? just wanted to quickly mention, uh, I went to both game three and four, just living here in Atlanta. I had all my Knicks gear on. And one thing I want to go ahead and debunk right now, I know we were talking about um, Atlanta being MSG South. I'll tell you one thing, man, those Hawks fans definitely showed up and they gave it to me as I was like, you know, was coming in and leaving. So I wasn't too happy about that. But as far as the game, uh, man, um, CP, you hit all the points that I wanted to actually uh, talk about, man. The the Hawks, they, they got it together. The Hawks got it together, man, with um, Trey Young just being as dangerous as he is and the role players stepping up. They, they, like what you said earlier, they got our number, and that's definitely the truth. It doesn't matter if we start. If we're Peyton at the one, Derek Rose at the one, Neil Aquino at the one, that pick and roll is lethal. I mean, it's either going to be the floater, the lob, or they're kicking it out to a shooter, and those shooters are knocking it down. So, I mean, hopefully they come out on Wednesday and, you know, show some effort. But, like, you know, I, I, I mean, we had a great season. I, I love that we're here, but it is what it is at this point. Um, secondly, uh, I just wanted to go ahead and touch on uh, another thing. The Hawks, man, they, they got some bucket getters, and I think that's what the Knicks are missing, man. We don't got a lot of guys who can create easy shots for themselves or their teammates. I think uh, Magic Johnson, when it was uh, getting closer to the uh, trade deadline, we were talking about getting Lonzo Ball. Um, he was he said one thing that, like, stuck with me this whole time, and we, we don't get a lot of easy buckets. We take uh, Julius Randle, our leader, takes a lot of tough shots, and he's been making it throughout the season. But obviously now he's, he's been missing it a whole lot. But outside of Julius Randle, we don't get a lot of uh, easy buckets, and I think that's one thing that we we gotta uh, you know get uh, through the off season or through the draft or whatever. But either way, man, I thank you guys for doing thank what you, you do. Y'all have a great. Appreciate you, man. Appreciate yeah. you, Josh. New York's number one draft pick. You're coming up in the chat. Yo, CP, Ashley, CK, throw that thumbs up for your squad. What up, y'all? Uh, 
Uh, nice seeing y'all. Nice seeing CP, CP the artist, Papa Left, J Boogie in the flesh. The community is official, you know, having everybody out there in Atlanta representing. But man, let me tell you, that was torture. Seeing seeing that whole second half was torture. In the, I mean, you guys at home just relaxing. You guys can just, you know, grab a drink after that and call it a day. But man, us us out at the game had to see Atlanta fans celebrating, doing their thing, swag surfing in the arena. You know, I wanted to join in for a bit, but nah, <laughs> I was too sad for that. But you know, all in all, uh, we we've had a great season. And that's all you can ask for. I mean, I, I wish we could do what we, we've been doing. I wish we could do better than what we're doing. Uh, hopefully we come with a stronger game uh, on Wednesday, I think it is, next game. But Wednesday, Wednesday I hope we, we come back with a stronger game. And But, I mean, a few things. I mean, Reggie Bullock hasn't really been there for us. He, he's talked a big game. But he has really been he hasn't he hasn't really been in there for us. And another thing, uh they haven't the uh Trey Young had like three fouls in the first half and uh Tibbs uh failed to, you know, go at him with, with the the uh, try to get him in foul trouble. I mean, yeah, we needed to do that to 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 get their first offensive weapon out, out of the game, you know, because uh, I mean we were lacking there. And I mean, I don't know what else to say, uh, but it was good. It, it's been a good season. Hopefully we come back stronger. Uh, Appreciate it, bro. Let me get to my guy, King Deej. King Deej, go ahead and unmute your mic, man. We didn't hear from King Deej yet. I'm going to just put it in perspective. You know, I'm not being Debbie Downer. I've been all positive, all 72 games. But at the end of the day, like, like CP said, skill versus will. And like how, I, how I've been saying since the beginning of the season, the problem is the backcourt. When your backcourt doesn't give you anything and it's just Derrick Rose fighting for his life out there in a four-game series, this is what happens. We got to address. So going forward, I don't want to hear about Trey Randall. I don't want to hear about Trey RJ. RJ was out there fighting for his life with Derrick Rose today, doing everything that that kid could possibly do at the age of 20. E4. At, the end of the day, at the end of the day, this series comes down to backcourt and depth. You got one backcourt that's shooting the lights out, getting wherever they want to get. Bogey and Trey. A lot of people not giving respect to that team, man. That team, all, all the knocks about them being defensively, that, that's not true. If you look it up since Nate McMillan took over, man, they've been in the top 10 in defense. They've been in the top 10 in all. So y- y'all got to y'all gotta pay attention to more than just Knicks basketball, man. This team is matched up. And like, like you guys were saying, I'm not even going to blame Randall because at the end of the day, this team, this team that we're watching is what is the same team that we watched from the regular season, except for the exception of the shots aren't falling. We led the league in isolations with Julius Randall. He carried us all the way here. So right. stop talking him. We led the league in, we, we led the league with defensive ratings, but still you got to score. You got to be able to score, bro. You can't just, all, you can't just knock, you can't just lock down and not score. So at the end of the day, it's a learning experience. We shouldn't even be in this position. Stop blaming Tibbs. I don't know what y'all. I don't know what y'all expect Tibbs to do. He's not a magician. I I get it with the cutting and like the minor details. But at the end of the day, that Hawks team today, everybody that got off that off that team off that bench shot a three, except for Clint Capella. So at, at the end of the day, it's all about talent, skill, three point shooting, and what we need to address. And that's why me and CK have been stuck on this. Lonzo Ball. Get him here, not just for the not just for the fact that he's a point guard, but he's six six, defensively sound, could get you easier looks in a half court and in a fast break setting. Also, could shoot the three ball, so he's not it's not one on five basketball. When I was talking about that Miles Turner trade deadline rumors, this is why get Click Capella away from the rim. He's got to respect the fact that Turner can shoot, even if he doesn't make it. You got to respect that you got to guard it. At the same time, he's an offensive nightmare in the paint as well. So you, this is the Knicks team. What y'all seeing right now is what it is, and it's just step one. We got 50 million. Hopefully, Leon is a wizard at what he's doing, and it gets better. I don't expect us to lose Game Five. I expect us to go guns blazing. Now, don't I, even though I'm talking about the future, we should go out guns blazing at Game Five, force a Game Six, and then let let fate decide what it is. But it, I'll tell you one thing: if we win that Game Five and then it's up for grabs at Game Six, 
Atlanta don't want to be here for Game Seven because all those role players that you see stepped up, Gallo, Kevin Herter, those guys were non-factors at the Garden. They they were factors at home. Cook food, good chill area. So just win Game Five. That's all. That's that's the only thing that should be on their mind. Win Game Five. Defend your home base, and then going forward, fix that backcourt. Reggie, I love you. You're my guy, but you give you giving me offers and then you're giving me trash talk and you're not playing right. You're not playing smart. We're playing tough, but we're not playing smart. Game three or four, we wasn't playing smart, man. So I'm just looking at it as a realistic fan. This is the this was the this was the cap. And everybody should just big up and salute that, man. Because that Hawks team, that's a real problem. And we're gonna be in the future battling them. So they ain't going nowhere. They only gonna get better. So just yeah. everybody chill out. Focus for Game 5 and take it one day at a time. I'm out, y'all. Peace and love. Appreciate it, man. Appreciate it.